Praise the Lord. Let's rise up as we pray together. Father, we thank you at this time. We bless your name because you brought us here. So you can form us and reform us and refashion us and remold us. So we can be like the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, Redeemer, Master, and Lord. Lord, we pray all the grace that is necessary to refashion, remold us to be like Jesus. You grind to us in Jesus' name. And we pray from this very night, your word will come with power, with function, and will come with knowledge, understanding to every heart, every life, in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, you open the pages of the scriptures, and you make us to understand what we ought to be. Our desire, just like we are in singing, is that we'll be like Jesus Christ. Form the image of Christ in every one of us, in Jesus' name. Be with us, Lord, that we may be like you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Once again, I welcome every one of us to the Congress at this time. We have lined up quite a lot of things. And you'll be hearing the word of God coming from the pulpit here. And it will be coming to you directly, straight to your heart. And I pray that as uh, the choir ministers, as all our other ministers, their ministry and we are preaching, I pray that the hand of God will be upon every one of us in Jesus' name. And will be the kind of people, ministers, leaders, preachers, pastors, evangelists that we ought to be. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 26 in the leadership sessions uh, all through this time. And you'll find that there's so much in this chapter. We're beginning tonight. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 26. I'm reading from verse 1. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth his hand and answered for himself. We're thinking about Paul and talking about Paul and reading the scriptures about Paul. And tonight, as we begin the introductory message, we're talking about the passion of a single-minded man. If anybody ever was single-minded, having just one goal, one ambition, one drive, one, one thing, enthusiastic, that was enthusiastic about, that was Paul the Apostle. He was a man with passion, and he was a single-minded man. Only single-minded men can make any impact for the, for the Lord in the world in which we live. An indifferent man cannot make the world different. An indifferent man cannot make the church different. That is, a person that is passive, indifferent, not caring. And whether things are going down or going up, it matters not to him. Such a man that is satisfied with the status quo, he cannot never make any impact in the world in which we live. But you understand, Paul, the apostle, he was preeminently a single-minded man, a single-minded minister, a single-minded messenger. As a sinner, he was single-minded. As a believer, he became, he still retained a single-mindedness. When he was a persecutor, he was a single-minded persecutor. It's like he abandoned every other thing he did and he pursued the persecution of the church with relentless effort. A single-minded persecutor. Then he became a preacher and he was a single-minded preacher. He was, as a Christian, a stranger and a pilgrim. He was a single-minded pilgrim this is the one way he was going to take his mind was set for heaven his gaze was set for heaven his mind and his gaze and his life everything was in the direction of heaven a single-minded pilgrim was writing Jesus and he told them he was their father and then a nursing mother and then their shepherd in short it was a single-minded pastor he had no other thing to do. He was ready to pour out his life for the, for the sheep. Ready to pour out his life for the members of the church. A single-minded pastor. And then he became a prisoner. Those Pharisees and Sadducees and the Sanhedrin, they took him, the council. And he said, this is too much. 
we employed you and gave you a letter of authority to go to Damascus and go and kill the people and get them into the prison. You got converted in the way. And you are doing more than the people that were there before you. They threw him into the prison. And you find Paul, the apostle, in the prison, the single purpose and the single desire and the single job they had to do. He kept at it. It was a single-minded prisoner. And then, if you're talking about pillars in the church, in fact, he said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And the people that came before me, I did more than, much more than what they did. It was a single-minded pillar in the church, and it was a pattern. He said, the Lord had called me that I will be a pattern to other people, and that was a single-minded pattern. Persecutor, single-minded. A preacher, single-minded. A pilgrim, single-minded. A pastor, he was single-minded. A prisoner, single-minded. A pillar, single-minded. And a pattern, single-minded. We are called to be single-minded men and women. That is, what does it mean to be a single-minded man? A single-minded woman? A single-minded minister? It means you have just one ambition a man of one ambition nothing else interests him just one ambition it means you are a man of one book all the other books you might read you might open but this one book you bury yourself in it and then you you read it you study it you swallow it you sink it deep into your heart a man of one book a man of one covenant he had no covenant with any other person just this covenant with the almighty god that was it it may claim his life it may have to give his blood for it it was a man of one covenant a man of one devotion that's a single-minded man he has no other thing he's devoted to and you find him in the morning in the afternoon in the evening just this one devotion was all he cared for he was a man of one endeavor just one thing busy at it busy at it responsibility all the time a man of one endeavor a man of one focus he had no other thing he was looking at in fact in his own case he didn't even care for the things of life. And he was writing to Timothy. He wanted Timothy to be just like him, a son in the faith. And then he said, any man that is chosen of God, he will not entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. He was a man of one goal, one goal, only one goal, only one destination, that place, this one thing I do. I'm at it, I'm at it, I'm at it. I'm walking at it. No other thing. In one goal, it was a man of one heart. His mind was not divided. His heart was not divided. A man of one interest. That's a single-minded man. He's not interested in game. Olympics were very serious and very prevalent at the time of Paul the Apostle. He had no time for that. He had no time for that. He was a man of one interest, a man of one joy. The only thing that gives him joy when he sees people converted, those people converted, they may be in the community, they may be in the city, maybe in the village, they may be in the prison, it doesn't matter. This is my joy. He said, he was writing to the church, he said, you are my joy, the fulfillment of my life. Then a man that has just one king. Caesar was there. Nero was there. He didn't recognize that. Just a man that has one king. A man that has one lord. A man that has one master. A man of one necessity. Necessity is laid upon me. And woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. That's the kind of man we're looking at. When you are like that, and there's no other thing that interests you, there's no other thing that catches your attention. But there's just one thing a man of one office. And he magnified out of his. He said, the Lord has appointed me and anointed me to the Gentiles. And I magnify my ministry, my office. And other people may become presidents, may become the head and the chairman of the Sanhedrin, may become politicians, whatever. That did not interest him. Just this one 
office the Lord had called him to. He was a man of one purpose, a man of one purpose. You couldn't get him to sway him here or sway him there. That's what we're talking about, the passion of a single-minded man. And he was a man of one question. Am I pleasing the Lord? Am I going his direction? Am I doing what he wants me to do? Am I fulfilling the reason for which I am called? Just that one question was a thing that mattered to him. A man of one resolution. A man of one resolution. This is what she do. Storm or wind or people or imprisonment will not hinder him. A man of one standard. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And Peter may do whatever he wants to do. He'll rebuke Peter. He said, that is not the standard. Demons may, for, may forsake him. He'll say, that's not the way. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. He had just one standard. And that is what the Lord is calling you to be. A single-minded man. A man of one treasure. One treasure. The only thing that he counted as treasure, as riches, and he says we have this treasure in the vessel. Any other treasure outside there in the bank, in the city, in the business, in commerce, all that did not interest him. He was a man of one treasure, a man of one utterance that the Spirit gave him as the Spirit gave them utterance. And he will not speak for himself. And he said, I care not about any other thing. I, I determine not to know anything among you except him and Christ, him and him crucified. A man of one vision, a man of one way, a man of one yearning, just designing, just passionate. This is what I want. This is what I will do. And of course, a man of one zeal. That's Paul the Apostle. And you, you find a man like that, you cannot distract him. A man like that, you cannot derail him. A man like that, you cannot stop him because he's going somewhere. And that's why the Lord has brought us here so that this same heart and this same mind and this same will and this same passion, this same fire, the Lord will give every one of us in Jesus' name. Give me a good, good amen. amen. In Luke chapter 10, verse 42. Luke chapter 10, verse 42. But one thing is needful. Have you discovered that in your life? Here is what Jesus Christ said concerning Mary. And Jesus said, but one thing is needful. But if you're thinking about too many other things and this and this. And, and you have many iron rods in the fire. And you're checking this and checking this and checking that. You'll not be able to be a single-minded minister. A single-minded leader. But when you know know that one thing that one unique solitary thing in your life that the Lord is saying one thing is needful and Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her it will not be taken away from you in Psalm 27 I'm reading from verse 4 Psalm 27 we're looking at verse 4 in Psalm 27 verse 4, one thing have I desired of the Lord. One thing, one thing, one thing have I desired of the Lord. Uh, have you found that people are into, in, the, in the ministry and they desire too many things for personal enrichment and for personal fulfillment and for personal exaltation. They want this and they want this and they want this that for their personal lives but David said one thing only one thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple Philippians chapter 3 verse 13 in Philippians chapter 3 we're looking at verse 13 just one thing just one thing that's how you can have passion when you concentrate all your effort all your mind all your will all your intelligence all your skill all your ability everything you've got within you you concentrate on just one thing that's what the lord is asking us to do that's the only time you can have passion 
And you'll not be tired because you're not too busy. You're not, you're not thinking about too many things. And then what you say and what you do and the life you live will, will account for God and will amount to something. But uh, when you are here and there, your mind is uh, kind of scattered and spread over too many things. You'll not be able to have the passion. And the single-mindedness the Lord is calling you to. Philippians chapter 3 verse 13. Yeah, it tells us in verse 13, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. Here is Paul the apostle again. But this one thing I do. He woke up in the morning and said, this one thing. I did it yesterday. I'm going to do it again. But when you do something over and over and over, that gives you perfection. You'll be able to perform very well. But if you just do this now, then you abandon that. And then you do another thing, you abandon that. You do another thing, you abandon. you'll never perfect anything in your life. But when you keep at just one thing, just one thing, one thing, it says, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into unto those things which are before I press forward toward the mark for the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I pray that that spirit that presses on, presses on, presses on, and never looks back, the Lord will give every one of us in Jesus' name. We're going to divide the, the message tonight to three parts. Number one, the presentation of a single minded minister. The presentation. I've read it to you already in Acts of the Apostles chapter 26 from verse 1. Agrippa said unto Paul, thou art permitted to speak for thyself. That was his presentation. So that he could defend the gospel and so that he'll be able to tell the reason why he did what he did and preach what he preached and stayed the way he stayed and why the Jews arrested him. Point number two. The past life of a single minded man. He wasn't a believer just a man. He was, he was just a man but a single minded man. The past life of this single minded minded man. Number three, the passion of all single minded messengers. The passion of all single minded messengers. We're looking at number one, the presentation of a single minded minister. Let's read it. this again. Acts of the Apostles chapter 26 verse 1. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. As we read through the whole chapter, you'll find that uh, Paul the Apostle didn't speak actually for himself. He spoke for the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that, that's what you'll find about a man of one goal, one dream, one desire, one passion, one pursuit. That you're permitted to speak for thyself. Oh yes, he gave some historical things about himself and then he launched into the message of the gospel and the death of Christ and resurrection of Christ and the repentance that is necessary that at the end, almost at the end, a great person said Paul almost thou persuaded me to be a Christian I told you to speak to your, for yourself and to defend yourself and now at the end you almost persuade me to join you and be a Christian you know when you have just that one passion and you have that one dream, one desire, one goal, one ambition. And you are a man that has just one ministry. And your concentration and your mind and your desire is to see people saved. At no time do you want to defend yourself or work for yourself. At no time do you want to exalt yourself. All you want to do is to find an opportunity to speak for the Lord. Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretch forth what again the hand only one hand why because the other hand was changed to a soldier that's why if you read uh, on in the chapter when he said Agrippa I don't want you to be almost a Christian I want you to be all together like me except these bonds and that thing was changed to another to another soldier and the one single hand remaining he, he stretched up that he said everybody pay attention I, when I get to heaven I'd like to see that Paul about you 
you like to see him. That man just had one thing, only one thing he concentrated on. And he answered for himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I, answer, I shall answer for myself this day before the touching all these things whereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee he hear me patiently now you understand paul the apostle was the person that preached long messages this was a king agrippa and also festus uh, was also like a governor and these uh, highly placed people he said now you need to pay attention to me don't look at me as a prisoner i'm a preacher and i'm going to give you the whole deal so listen to me and listen patiently the presentation of such a ministry and then as you think about him and you look at the things that we have read about him from chapter 9 of Acts of the Apostles Acts of the Apostles chapter 9 I'm reading from verse 15 Acts chapter 9 verse 15 but the Lord said unto him go thy way he, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. To bear my name before the kings. And so when Agrippa said, Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. He went back to his calling. He went back to his commission. He went back to what the Lord had said about him. That when you come before the kings, they can tell you anything. They can say, speak for yourself. They can say, prove this. They can say, disprove this. They can say, answer the question. But it, remember, I'm sending you before those kings and before those governors so that you'll bear witness concerning me. Paul, the apostle, never forgot that. Never forget the, the reason for your call and the reason for your ministry. And even though you are told to speak for yourself, go back to your original and speak for the Lord Jesus Christ. He has raised you up to be a witness. Acts of the Apostles chapter 22. Acts of the Apostles chapter 22. We're reading there from Versace. It says on the morrow, because he would have he would have known the certainty whereof he was accused of the Jews. He loosed him from the bands and commanded the chief priests and all the council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. That's another time now that he was to answer for himself. And what did he do when he was to answer for himself? He look at it now chapter 23 verse 1 and Paul earnestly beholding the council uh, this was not an intimidated prisoner a frightened prisoner a person that will be looking at anywhere he found himself in the courtroom or before the kings or anywhere he carried himself as a preacher and he carried himself as somebody that will testify about the Lord Jesus Christ even though he was in chains even though they accused him and then the accusation landed him before those people that were examining him he was not discouraged because of that intimidated or frightened God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity but he has given us the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind that was a kind of mind the Lord gave him that's why earnestly beholding the counsel he looked at them if you're going to communicate the gospel, if you're going to communicate and preach a sound word, sound doctrine unto the people that are listening to you, you cannot be looking down every time. Have you found preachers sometimes they've written all their notes and they're reading, they're reading word for word, word for word, and while they're looking down, they wouldn't know if the people they're talking to are standing up and going to the toilet. And you know, by the time they look up, when they say the final amen, half of the congregation is gone. I hope you are not a preacher like that. You look at the people like Paul, the Apostle, it's our pattern. And he has told us, he has shown us how to declare the truth and the words to the people that need to hear. Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day and then he went on talking to them. Look at verse 11. The night following the Lord stood by him and said, 
be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem. That's all he was doing. That's all he was doing when he called him. Now you can bear witness to yourself. Now you can defend yourself. Instead of defending himself, all he did was that he bore witness to the Lord, and then so must thou bear witness also at Rome. I'm coming to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 24. Acts, chapter 24. I'm reading from verse 24. There was another chance given to him that he will bear witness and will talk for himself. What did he do? How did he do? How did he approach it? And let's look at it. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 24, verse 24. It says in verse 24, after certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness, of temperance, and of judgment shall come, Felix trembled. He was somebody who was to judge Paul. He was sitting on the judgment seat to judge Paul. And then he said, okay, Paul, let me listen to you. So I will see the reason whereof these people accuse you. And instead of defending himself and talking about himself, he began to talk. He reasoned of righteousness and of temperance and of judgment. The judgment to come. And what happened to Felix? He trembled and answered, Go thy way, for this time when I have a convenient season, I will call thee. And so you understand that every time he was called and he presented himself, he did that which he ought to do. When it comes to your turn to defend yourself, when they bring you before your village chief or the leaders of community, I pray you'll be able to stand like Paul the Apostle. And you'll declare the gospel without fear, without favor, in Jesus' name. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge, notwithstanding the Lord stood with me. The Lord will stand by you and strengthened me. Now we understand. Now we see the secret of his courage, the secret of his strength, and the secret of his ability to be able to stand anywhere he was called. And he preached the gospel and defended the faith creditably because the Lord strengthened him that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered from the mouth of the lion. He will deliver you. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto, the he unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever Amen. Point number two now, the past life. The past life. When, when you look at Paul the Apostle, there's something you're going to find. You'll find this in all his epistles. And you find this in the things he said, we say, impromptu. Impromptu. That is, he did not uh, prepare any notes like, being, you know, having chance, a long time, a long notice, so that he would have prepared introduction and then point one, point two, point three, and the conclusion. He didn't have all that time to prepare. And even though he was called impromptu, just stand up now and defend yourself. And then he began to talk. You'll find everything logical. He went to the past life, he went to his conversion. And then he went into the ministry and he went into why he is here now at this very time. And then he made a conclusion and then he made an altar call wanting the people. King Agrippa, believest of the prophets, I know thou believest. And then King Agrippa said, Paul, almost you persuade me. Um, uh, they, all the sin, the data you have given me, all the information you have given me, is that like you want to bring conviction upon me. I'll think about it. And Paul said, This is the time to decide. And uh, the Lord wants to make of us like that. So anytime you are called and you have to say something and you have to speak for the Lord Jesus Christ, you will speak authoritatively and effectively and convincingly. And the people of the world will hear about Jesus from you. 
the past life of a, of this single-minded man. We're looking at him now just as a man, just as a man, and yet he was single-minded. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 26, verses 4 and 5. My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among my own nation at Jerusalem, knew all the Jews, which knew me, from the beginning, if they will testify that after the most traitor sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. He dug up the past. By the way, he always did that. He never forgot the pit from which Christ dug him. He never forgot the ruined life and the ruined past from which Jesus Christ brought him. He never forgot what would have been, what would have become of him if Christ has not found him. And when you remember what you were, then you remember the grace of God and the mercy of God and the, and the love of God that has brought you out of that pit and has brought you to where you are now. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 22 verse 3, Acts chapter 22. Verse 3, still talking about the past life. I am very lame, man, which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous toward God as she all are this day. Day. He talked about what it was in the past. Why did he talk about that? When you see how dark the night was, then you'll see how bright the day now is. When you see the death of degradation in which somebody has fallen and you look at his past life, then you will know how, how high the mountain peak where Christ has brought him. When you know how black a man was because of the charcoal of character that was on him. And now you see how Jesus Christ with his precious blood has washed and cleansed him and it's now whiter than snow. And you compare the blackness of the past with the brightness of the present, then you will know the grace of God that has worked mightily in his life. That's the reason why he dug to the past and he said, this is what I was. And I pray that our own lives will also be better in Jesus' name. Galatians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 13. Galatians chapter 1, reading from verse 13. For ye have heard of my, com of my conversation, that is my manner of life, in time past, in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. When you see how you wasted the church of God, destroyed the church of God, but now he's building, now he's developing. You will be able to compare between the past and the present, and then you will know that actually change had taken place. If any man be in Christ, is what? A new creature, all things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. In verse 14, and I profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of the fathers. He said, I was really zealous in that religion. As you look at Paul the Apostle, what he was in the past, and you see him as a single minded person, what can you say? Number one, he was a single minded sinner. A single minded sinner. Yes, he was a sinner, but single minded. Single minded. He had a project. He had a plan, and he had something that he wanted to do as a sinner. His project and plan was to destroy the church and to waste the church, and he concentrated just on that. His trade, that is the tent-making trade, he didn't even spend much time on that. He was so single-minded as a sinner, he persecuted the church. Number two, he was a single-minded student. He learned under Gamaliel. And when he learned under Gamaliel, he really studied. That is why whenever you read Paul the Apostle, he's referring to the Old Testament. He knew all those Old Testament scriptures when he was yet a sinner. And when you are a person like that, that when you are in the world, before you even became converted, you said, this one thing I do. 
this Old Testament that the Pharisees took very seriously. I'm going to study it in and out. And that's what he did. A single-minded student of the Old Testament scriptures. Number three, a, a single-minded slave of Satan. Slave of Satan. And that thing the devil told him to do and drove him to do and um, developed within him he just concentrated on that he was a slave of the devil and a single-minded slave he never deviated from here or there just that that evil thing is what uh, he did and uh, you still find sinners like that today uh, some some sinners are committing their lives into uh, pop show or pop music or whatever and uh, dreaming about it and thinking about it and studying about it and practicing everything and they actually excel in that evil thing that they do other people are into bad character bad lifestyle and, and they don't do any other thing there are some sinners that will not even go to a nightclub or go to this or uh, go to parties because they are concentrating on the evil thing they want to do. They are single-minded slaves of the devil. That was Paul the Apostle. He was a single-minded sinner, a single-minded student, a single-minded slave, a single-minded separatist. And that's actually the meaning of a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Who studied under a respected, honorable Pharisee? It was a Pharisee to the core, a separatist, and then he defended the law and the tradition of the fathers as a single-minded separatist. If you know the, the distance they shouldn't walk on the Sabbath, they was committed to that, and the things they shouldn't do in the synagogue, he committed himself to that. And you think of believers today; they are not single-minded on obeying the word of God and looking at the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and being meticulous as to the detail and the things the Lord has commanded us to do. But in the case of Paul, the apostle one was Saul of Tarsus. He was a single minded separatist. Not only that, he was a single minded schemer. A single minded schemer. He was a planner. He planned his persecution. He went from city to city. I'll go to this, number one. After that, I'll go to this, number two. And that is network of informants. The Christians, they're over there. The Christians are over there. He never went to a place where the Christians were not. He was a schemer and a single-minded schemer. You think about Christians today. They never plan anything. They never scheme anything. And they're never able to put things the way it ought to be because they're just haphazard here and there. But Paul the Apostle, when he was a sinner, he was a schemer. And yet a single-minded schemer. And if he was going to Damascus, he will not forget, I need letter of authority from the council. He'll, he'll do first thing first, and after that, second thing, after that, the third thing, before he will take the journey. What a lesson we learn, even from Paul the Apostle, when he was a sinner. A single-minded schemer. And then he was a single-minded self-seeker self-seeker he had an old program and whatever i want he said i profited in the juicery more than all my equal he wanted to excel and go beyond everybody and be promoted beyond everybody a single-minded self-seeker and this is this was paul the apostle and this is what he was that even from his childhood he never knew about indecision about being passive about being cold about being lukewarm about being nonchalant not paul not saul even from his early children as a sinner single-minded sinner, single-minded student, single-minded slave, single-minded separatist, single-minded schemer, single-minded self-seeker. We're looking at Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 4. 
In Philippians chapter 3, we're looking at verse 4. It says, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he has whereof he might trust in the flesh, I am all circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what, what things were gained to me, tell me the rest. Uh, you know, uh, this, this man, he was a, a single-minded, sincere sinner. Sincere sinner. All he did, he did, he did, no sense of his He thought the religion of the Jews was the real thing. And because of that, he pursued that with all his energy and with all his resources. But now, when he saw the light, and the light shone on the way to Damascus, he abandoned everything just like that. And you know, the compassion of Paul the Apostle was not a gradual, slow, day-by-day -day change and transformation. It was sudden. It was instantaneous. And immediately he saw the light. He said, this is light. So I've been in darkness all my life. The change came. Instantaneous change. It wasn't a person I dropped this today. I'm still holding on to this. I'll drop this another time. Instantaneous change and transformation came on him. It can happen to you tonight. That God just opens your eyes and you say, how am I spending my life? What am I doing? What have I achieved? Where am I going? What do I want to have? What impact do I want to make on my generation? And all of a sudden, the light shines into your heart from heaven. And you say, now I see, now I see. I'm not going to wait for another day. An instantaneous change and transformation comes. They will say, Lord, help me. I will be the kind of man, the kind of person I ought to be. And you will be in Jesus' name. I now come to point number three, the passion of all single-minded messengers. The passion, the passion of all single-minded messengers. Uh, we're coming back to this Paul the Apostle now, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. By this time now, he had written some epistles. By this time, he had gone to the gentle world and had preached unto them. By this time, he had been in prison in many places. By this time now, he had touched the lives of many. And yet, he said, brethren, I do not count myself as having apprehended everything, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before do you know that those who succeed in life, this is uh, what they do, this is how they live, this is how they think, this is how they plan. Yes, they thank God for the success of yesterday. Yes, they thank God for the progress of last week. Yes, they thank God for the impact of whatever they did last week. But then they wake up this morning, this is a new day. And this is a new week. And this is a new chance. And this is a new opportunity for me to do something for the progress of the kingdom of God. And they forget the past, reaching forth unto those things which are before. Me. If a new technology comes, they say, this is new. I'm going to explore this. If a new contact comes their way, they say, this is new. I'm going to explore the possibilities. Here. If there is a new congress that we're just starting today, this is a new congress. I'm going to investigate. I'm going to explore what this will contribute into my life. Yes, I thank God for what I got last week at the retreat, what I got the year before, what I got the other time. But this is new. And I want to see what this new opportunity will bring into my life. And those who are progressive and those who are successful, that's what they do. Forgetting the things that are past and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Uh, but 
but you know the people that stay at you know the plateau level at the status quo and they're still busy nursing the wound of yesterday and they're still busy kind of singing their praises of what happened to them yesterday and they're calling their friends do you know what happened last week do you know what happened last month i've not seen you for so let me tell you some stories about what i did at this time at this time such people never make too much progress they do not see the sky and they do not see the peak of the mountain they do not see what is still far ahead of them and what they need to achieve they do not see what the lord is calling them to sing come up higher all they can see is just the past and then they feel that they've done their very best the other time and there's nothing they can do today but not paul the apostle this man said brethren i count not myself to have appended or to have done anything so substantial i'm just doing this one thing i'm looking forward and i want to be higher and greater and have greater impact in my world i pray that will be your heart that's why i said in verse 14 i press i press toward the mark i press toward the mark uh, did you know the, the people that so see you know what they do look up here they set up a mark like this when they set up this mark is like this and if they're reaching it then they raise the mark then if they're reaching that they raise the mark again if they're reaching that they raise the mark again and that's how you will be able to make progress but if you leave the standard there all the time and then when you approach it and you jump that hurdle and then you say i broke the record it won't take one week another person will break the record and go beyond you it's when you keep on lifting the standard raising the standard lifting it higher that's when you'll be able to make progress in life he said i press toward the mark for the price of the high calling of god in christ jesus i pray you will do that because Paul, the apostle, has been given to us as a pattern. That what we see him, what we have seen him do, we also we need to do the same thing. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 16. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 16. How be it for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus might show forth all long suffering for a pattern for a pattern that as you see paul the apostle you know some people will just say well that's paul that's paul his constitution was different his background was different his training was different his uh, development was different and then his uh, ability to be able to take all that shock and able to do this that's different they will never aim to be like that because they think that paul the apostle was a class by himself but he said no all I did, I did by grace. And if God is no respecter of persons, that grace is available for everyone. And that grace is available for you too. And you will have that grace in your life in Jesus' name. So he said, the Lord has raised me up as a pattern. I'm looking at Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. And we're reading there from verse 23. Galatians chapter 1, verse 23. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which he once destroyed. He started to do something very much opposite brothers and sisters would you look for for a moment you know sometimes in our lives when we are full of ourselves and we have the respect of many many people and we've given our word that this is what i will do we want to stay by what we said and people will say I am a man of my word. And even when they know that that is not the way, you could do something different. You could become better. And you could enrich the world with supernatural power. They say, but I've committed myself. And this is the way I'm going. The things I destroyed, if I now begin to build it up, what will that look like? It will look like I'm a man of indecision. And yet I know I'm an iron cast constitution. 
myself. But he said, this is what they heard about me. That that which he which persecuted us in times past when he saw the light. And when he saw that things had to change, that he said, what's my life going to amount to? Jesus Christ is calling me from heaven. And he says, Saul, Saul, what persecutest thou me? And I wondered, anybody speaking from up there must be the Lord. Who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus Christ, whom thou persecutest. He said, it didn't take me a moment, a minute. I changed. I said, Lord, what will you have me to do? That now he preaches the faith which he once destroyed. You see, that's why God gives grace to people. The people that see, okay, I was doing that wrong. This is the right way to do And they change immediately. I was going the wrong direction. I thought that was the right thing to do. That was what my training, the information I had, that's what he gave me. But now this is what you do. Those are the people who are blessed by God. God will bless you. I said, God will bless you. And he glorified God in me. We will glorify God in you. Now this, uh, Paul the Apostle, went now he's now on this other side, he was still single-minded. Single-minded. I will see single-minded man. Number one was single-minded servant of Christ. A single-minded servant of Christ. He said, I served the devil, I served the Sanhedrin, I served religion, and I gave them the best shot I had. Now I'm on the side of Christ. I'm going to be a single-minded servant. Number two was a single-minded soul seeker. Soul seeker. Everywhere now he went was seeking for soul. Seeking for soul. When you become single-minded like that and the passion and the fire, the zeal of heaven begins to burn in your heart. You'll be seeking after the souls. It will not be your desire that anybody will perish. You'll be number one. A single single-minded servant number two is single-minded soul seeker number three is single-minded steward steward of the mysteries of the kingdom of god the lord had committed this to what she into his hand and he said this one i'm going to keep it this one i'm going to watch over it. this one i'm going to embrace it this one i'm going to give it to other people a single-minded steward Number four is single-minded soldier. That man was a soldier of the cross. If nobody ever was a single-minded soldier, that man was. Paul the apostle, he never counted any pain, never counted any suffering, never counted any difficulty, never counted any imprisonment. He was sick in the prison. If this is the place the ministry has landed me praise the lord silas give me a chorus there we need to sing we need to sing about the glory of god and then they began to sing and they were not singing as people miserable prisoners the miserable persecuted people that were so much afraid and frightened if they have done this to us during the day what are they going to do to us in the night if we have gone through this now what do we know we're going to have Never. Paul the apostle was such a single-minded soldier of the cross that nothing hindered him. The suffering and the pain and all the agony and all the deprivation that he went through in the prison, he said, this is the life God has called me to now. I will live it and live it with joy. That leads me to the next point, number five, a single-minded sufferer. Single-minded sufferer. He said, I know what I'm suffering. If, if I suffer for this, and then because of the suffering, I turn back. Then my suffering will be in vain. If I am going to suffer, if the Jews are going to persecute me because of the decisions I've taken and because of the life I'm living, let me live it to the full so that I will know what I'm suffering for. And the more he suffered, the more he did that again as a single-minded sufferer. Number six, a single-minded standard bearer. He lifted up the standard that like this 
and as they contending for the faith was delivered unto the saints and even those people in the council and those people that imprisoned him they couldn't bring down that standard and as we, nobody can preach now in the church any church anywhere in the world for a whole year without mentioning some of the epistles of Paul the apostles it's everywhere it's everywhere from the Acts of the Apostles to the Romans to the First Corinthians and Second Corinthians and Galatians Ephesians Philippians Colossians First and Second Thessalonians and the Timothys and the Titus and the Philemon and Hebrews you, you just have to read them it's Paul the Apostle he lifted up the standard like this because it was a single minded standard bearer that nothing will be able to lower that standard and God will make that of you I said God will make that of in Jesus name so that anywhere you go anywhere you go it's your word that you quote from the scriptures that they'll be quoting because that is what you are single-minded at number seven is single-minded shepherd yes you know uh, being a soldier did not harden him being a soldier did not make him so tough that he did not know how to care for the sheep how to care for the flock how to care for the people of God it was still a single minded shepherd and to combine all that to combine all that what difficulty and what challenge will bring to him you know it's very difficult for somebody who is hardened by suffering to become very soft when dealing with children it's very difficult for somebody who is hardened by circumstances in life that you know this wind blew at him and that wind blew at him and made him strong I made him had inch I made him so courageous and said what else will come this one has come and this one has come and this one has come and I know what the devil is looking at the devil wants to use that to just tear me to pieces and then walk on me and the man has become so strong in his mind and yet for that same man who has become so hard and so tough by suffering by imprisonment by the soldier kind of life to not become a single-minded shepherd is the grace of god and god will give you that grace we're looking at first thessalonians first thessalonians chapter 2 first thessalonians chapter 2 verse 7 but we were gentle among you. You, you. you would, if I didn't read it to you, if I just talk about Paul being a soldier of the cross, a Paul the apostle being a servant of the Lord, able to endure anything, and he says, I take pleasure in persecution i take pleasure in trials i take pleasure in tribulation i take pleasure in everything that i've gone through and then to now know that this man was a shepherd at the same time but we were gentle among you even as a nurse cherishes her children so being affectionately desirous of you we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of god only but also our own souls because ye were dear unto us for ye remember brethren our labor and travail for laboring night and day because we will not be chargeable unto any of you we preached unto you the gospel of God ye are witnesses and God also how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe and this is what the lord is uh, wanting to get out of us and the lord will do it in jesus name we have come to this uh, congress with great expectation that the lord himself his hand will hold you and his hand will mold you and whatever is still lacking in your ministry in your life in your personality the lord will develop you during these days together in jesus name God specializes in recreation. Recreation. He has created us for us. And now he wants to recreate us and bring within us whatever may be lacking. That's the special, the special area of God and all the grace that you need, all the strength you need, all the power you need, all the anointing, the unction, all the outpouring of the Spirit of God you need, he'll give you at this time in Jesus' name. So that the passion, the fire, the zeal, the single-mindedness that the Almighty God wants to produce in you and in me and in us all together he will do it in jesus name so by the time we finish when you compare what you become and then to what you were before you came into the congress you say praise the lord the hand of the lord has transformed me
The Lord will do it for you in Jesus' name. If you are in agreement with God and you agree with God, what he's doing for other people, he will do for you. And when you get back, people might not even know you again. They will say, no, that's our pastor. And other people will say, but I thought you have another. I was here last year in your church. And this is a different. Oh, they say, no, he went for Congress and something happened to him. It will happen to you in Jesus' name. And then with love and with power, with strength, you'll be able to stand now as a single-minded minister doing the will of God. And many souls will come to the kingdom of God through in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. He wants to make something new, something beautiful, something great out of your life during this Congress. It's something new that had never, never, never happened before. You can open your mouth and tell the Lord and say, Lord, here am I. Lord, here am I. Lord, here am I. You'll do something. You know, if you act the same way you have always acted, if you pray the same way you have always prayed, if you think the same way you have always thought, and if you read the same way you have always read, and if you do the same thing you have always done, how are you going to have that transformation? Why don't you tell the Lord, I need a change, I need a transformation. I need something instantaneous, something so sudden right now. Oh Lord, open the heavens and touch my heart and touch my life and touch my personality and touch my mind and touch my soul and touch my spirit and touch my ministry afresh. Let him do it. Let him do it. That he'll kindle a fire within you that nobody will ever be able to put off. That he will kindle such zeal and such passion within you that nothing will be able to destroy. That God will give you a purpose, a plan, progress. That you single-mindedly follow after. That all those distractions you've been paying attention to in the past. The devil trying to distract your mind. The devil trying to derail you. And the devil trying to destroy the purpose for which you are called. And then now you're becoming kind of lukewarm, settling down at a plateau. But you want to pray, you want to tell the Lord, oh Lord, a new fire, a new zeal, a new passion, a new goal that you want to bring up within me as if I'd never done anything in the kingdom of God. Something new, something new, something new, something new. Enthusiasm, excitement is serving the Lord. All the lukewarmness for the Lord to throw away that lukewarm water inside your soul. All the laziness, passivity, all the slowness, all the procrastination, delaying this and delaying that, and never being able to put anything to fruition. Telling the Lord, oh Lord, do something, do something within me. And make a change, a great change. That you turn Saul to Paul. And the fire of God burnt in the soul of that man. And everybody knew and everybody saw. That this is a new man. A renewed man. A recreated man. A transformed man. That the darkness of the night of sin. Turned into the brightness of the day of saintliness. Why don't you tell the Lord during this Congress that the Lord will perform that, that the Lord will perfect that, that the Lord will accomplish that in your life. He has brought you into the ministry. He has given you a ministry. He wants you to succeed. Can you succeed without the fire of God on the altar? Can you succeed with the manner of yesterday? No fresh manner, no fresh thought, no fresh idea, no fresh passion, no fresh fire, and no fresh lie. Anointing and unction, power, 
authority, something new coming upon your soul. That he makes you more than a conqueror within. More than a conqueror within. Tell the Lord, oh Lord, here am I. Turn my weakness into strength. Weakness in my spirit, turn it into strength. Weakness in my soul, turn it into strength. Weakness in my body, in my mind, turn it into strength. Weakness in my ministry, turn it into strength. Weakness in my planning, turn it into strength. Weakness in my preaching, turn it into strength. A weak constitution, turn it into strength. A weak personality, turn it into strength. Let me see in a new way. Let me go in a new direction. Let me follow the newness of life with new passion and new zeal and new authority and new enthusiasm and new, new fire within me. As thy day, so shall thy strength be. The longer you are in the ministry, the longer you are in preaching, the longer you are in the ministry working for the Lord, the more your strength, your knowledge, your vision, your passion, your enthusiasm should increase. The longer you are in that youth ministry, the more you ought to see the new direction to follow. The longer you are in that campus ministry, the longer you are in that same thing, the, longer, the more you ought to see this is the way to go now. And this is the passion, the zeal, the fire with which I need to address the work now. The longer you are in the children ministry, the longer you are in the pastoral ministry, the more the fire will burn. The more you read, the more you pray, the more you prepare, the more you preach, the more you evangelize, the more you plan programs, the older you become, the older you become, the more, the more, the more you do. You'll not give any excuse. The more the devil tries to throw this at you and throw that at you, and the more the devil tries to tear your, your ministry apart, the more you give all the zeal and all the power and all the energy and all the skill you've got. Do more, do more, rise higher. No discouragement. Paul never expressed, Paul never allowed, Paul never allowed anything like this or despair to settle down in his life in his ministry always moving always planning always projecting always preaching always ministering always seeking souls always developing people always training people always evaluating always wanting to go higher always doing something doing something doing something if he was in the prison, he will write an epistle. If he was in the prison, he'll preach to all those guards, prison guards and wardens. He didn't allow circumstances or situation to tie his hand. Or to say, I cannot do anything now, God understands. This is my situation. This is my condition. And what I'm going through now, nobody expects to be able to do anything. Everywhere he went, everywhere he was, he did something with passion. Let that passion come up within you. The passion of a single-minded minister. A single-minded pastor over the church. Planning for that church to grow. Taking care of the young and the old. Taking care of the students, the youths and the adults. Taking care of the singles and the married. Always finding something to do as a single-minded pastor. Single-minded evangelist. The places to evangelize. The places to evangelize. Reaching all the places you have not reached. Touching the lives of people. Bringing them to the Lord. And after evangelizing and winning them to the Lord. Then conserving the soul. That you have won. Bringing them into the Ghana. Being stable disciples. Developing them. Give your heart to it. Give your very life to it. This is your calling. This is the commission. You'll pray more than ever before. You'll read more than ever before. You'll listen more than ever before. You'll preach more than ever before. You'll sing more than ever before. you put all your life into what you're doing. Passion. Passion. Single-mindedness. Sacrifice. That you give, you give, you give. Everything you've got. No time to waste. 
no moment to throw away no time for gossiping or jesting or backbiting or just talking or tail bearing you've gone beyond that level now your calling will not allow you to give time to those useless irrelevant worthless things let there be passion in your heart passion in your life passion in your soul that was single minded single minded single minded there'll be a wide wide difference between you a minister and the ordinary members of the church in praying in walking in laboring in sacrificing in giving in standing boldly courageously for the truth there must be a wide wide difference between you the minister and the ordinary members of your church you must be much higher above them and the passion should tell the praying should tell the enthusiasm should tell the excitement should tell the progress should tell the growth should tell the faith and the fearlessness and the courage and the conviction should tell a wide difference between the minister and the member of the church one thing this one thing i do this one thing i do this one thing i do commit yourself to that Commit your life to that. Let there be a new passion. Let there be a, a new zeal. Let there be a new commitment. Let there be a new consecration. Let there be a new sacrifice you are laying on the altar. And let your participation in this Congress be so far different from all your participation in the past. That same grace available for Paul the Apostle is available for you. That same change, transformation, available that we could see in Paul the Apostle, that's available for you too. The help of the Almighty God, available for Paul the Apostle, that help is available for you too. The single mindedness, the power, the unction, the life that is laid on the altar willing to do any sin and every sin for the glory of God. It was possible for Paul. It must be possible for you too. The courage, the faithfulness, the fearlessness, possible for him, must be possible for you too. It's all by grace. It's all by grace. It's all by grace. 